Dear friends in Christ, if you have your worship folder with you, we're going to be taking a look at Isaiah's Old Testament lesson, chapter 2. Again, as we are looking at the verse 1, it says, This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Dear friends in Christ, what was it a few days ago that Colorado got hit with, what was it, 15 to 17 inches of snow? And when you look, and for a place like that, people might go into panic, but if you looked at the news, you would see that the Coloradians, if that's what we'll call them, were racing and rushing and heading where? To the ski hills, to the mountains, right? And you could see them going down the hills, right, on the gondola. Everybody was having a good time. Maybe you are a skier and there's something about that air that just hits you and you're like, ah, this is what I want to do. Heading home on Thursday to my folks' place, It was fun to, as the children would ask, we weren't even past Paradise Drive, the children were asking, are we there yet? And we're like, "Mm." so we said, why don't you count the number of trucks that you see with snowmobiles on the back? And as we were heading south on 41, 45, there were trucks after trucks with snowmobiles heading up north, right, to enjoy some time and to enjoy some getaway out in the woods with their sleds. Even in a few weeks, ladies and gentlemen, and you're welcome to come if you just want to see your pastors, I'm telling Pastor Noel he's coming too, go tubing with the teens and watch us go down the hill and have a little bit of fun. To today, Isaiah the prophet is going to tell each and every one of you here today the same thing. Let's head to the hills. But what does he mean? It's going to be a little bit different than snowmobiling, skiing, or even tubing. If you take a look at our text, again, it says, in the last days, right? I want you to understand where we're at with the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is someone who had the joy and privilege of preaching to his own people. The book of Isaiah is often called a love story. You have doom and gloom. You have prophecy and proclamation. You have highs, you have lows. And again, to understand, the northern kingdom has already been carried off in captivity, And then there was this certain smugness that came with those people that lived in Judah, that lived around Jerusalem, that they're, well, you know, we're God's chosen people. We have the temple. There's nothing that's going to be going wrong in our lives, or there is nothing that is going to happen that will take us away from God. So as you look at this and you think about these words, I want you to focus on what the people must have been thinking when they heard these words. The mighty man will become tender, and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. That is the last verse of Isaiah 1, verse 31. That's how the verse ends, where Isaiah tells the people, you need to wake up. Judgment is coming. And for Isaiah and his people, it was going to be a judgment of the Babylonians, where the Babylonians would be the ones to carry away this small remnant of Judah. And there they would spend years in captivity. They would come back from captivity. 
They would look forward to the Messiah. They would see the Messiah. Then the Messiah would ascend, and now the Messiah is going to come back. That is Isaiah's perspective when he says it's the last days. And to the Israelite, the place that they would gather and the place that they would go on top of a hill was the temple. That was their safe place. That was where they felt they were close to God. And you know what would happen when the Babylonians would come in to that temple? (laughs) They leveled it. It was gone. Maybe just a wall, right, or two that you can think of when you uh, have the rebuilding process that takes place. But gone. To us today, when we think about it, we are in the last days. Does this phrase ever come across your lips? It comes across mine. Man, time just seems to be going so much faster now. Right? When I was with family a few days ago, they asked me, how are things going in West Bend? How long have you been there? And I had six months. Wow, you know. Doesn't seem like that. You're still stuck with me, okay? But we are living in the last days. And so where do we need to run? Where do we need to go? Well, Jesus told us it's not to a particular place. He said this in John 4.21 when he was speaking to the Samaritan woman. She's like, well, and I'll just set a little context here. She said, you know, We feel we have to go to Jerusalem because that's what you Jews tell us where we need to go and worship. And Jesus tells her, Believe me, a time is coming, woman, when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, for we will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And then Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Did you pick it up? Where do we need to run? Where do we need to go? Where is our safe place? Again, as New Testament Christians, it isn't a building. It is you. Where two or three come together. That's church. Do we think about that when we're behind closed doors? Do we think about that in the conversations that we have with other people? Where two or three come together? Or is it only the building that we are concerned about? I had a friend, he's a pastor. When they finished building their church, they had worshiped in a small little storefront. He's a little eccentric of a pastor. He walked into that brand new church on the first day of their worship carrying a bow and arrow. And he shot the arrow into the wall of the church, to which everyone was like, "Ah." and he said, friends, it's not about the building. It's about the people in the building. We are in the last days. When will that come? No one knows. When will that be? Again, we think about it from our gospel reading perspective, that the people in the flood, life was going on, carrying on as normal. And yet the flood came. For us, the end is going to come. But yet we don't need to be afraid because we have the power of God's Word. Again, if you look at the text as it says here that the... It says, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. Think about that. You go out. You go out with power. You go out with the word of God. We've talked about this. It's that dynamis, that dynamite that God equips you with. That God is the one that sends you out and He's encouraging us to be His light 
and, and his beacons to this dark world. And I understand at times we can say, well, I, I don't know. I, it's not dependent on you. Elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, he reminds us, so is the word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the hard work. The Holy Spirit is the one that uses, as it says here, the law will go out from Zion, that Torah, that word of God, that law, that gospel. And you need to have both, like wings on an airplane. I had a professor that said it once like this. He said, you can only get so far with one wing on an airplane. You need both. You need the law. You need the law to show the sin to ourselves and and to those around us. Sometimes we're like, well, I really don't want to point out to someone that's bad. That's giving them one wing of an airplane. But then there's the gospel, right? And some will think, well, this is loving if we just look the other way and don't confront the sin. When we apply God's word to ourselves, we see that we fail miserably. But when we apply that gospel to ourselves, we see just how redeemed and equipped we are. Equipped to share that message with anybody and everybody we come into contact with. And then we can also take a look at the fact that the results are already done. It says, They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The results have already been taken care of. Jesus went to uh, another hill for you and for me, and the battle has already been won. All of your sins are forgiven. And he will come again for you to take you to be with him forever in heaven. Do we live like that? Do we live like the battle has already been won? There's a story that Martin Luther once was stressed out, having having a difficult time dealing with some of the things of, well, probably being Martin Luther, right? And he was real mopey and walking around sad and depressed. So his wife went into their bedroom, got on her black funeral dress and was walking around very somber in front of Martin. And very puzzled, he looked at her and said, why are you wearing your funeral dress? And she looked at him and she said, well, I thought God had, had died and all is hopeless by the way you're acting right now. It was then that Luther realized the prize has already been won. Peace is ours. Do we walk around like that? Do we walk around with, oh, um, oh. And, and please, don't under, please understand, don't think that I'm saying that whatever struggles, whatever difficulties that you are going through don't matter. They matter. But do we end there, and do we not see the next step? That there's a God who is making that work out for our good that there's a God who has our end already planned. There is a God who is going to be coming back again, not as a babe in Bethlehem, but as the King of Kings to take you to be with him. So my friends, as we get ready to head to that cradle, run to the hills. It's good and relaxing to go down the ski hill with that wind in your face and very exhilarating and helps us forget about life's problems or if you're behind the throttle of a snowmobile or hanging on for dear life to a piece of plastic going down a hill. But that thrill is only temporary compared to the joy of heaven that lasts for eternity. Friends, it's the last days but you have power and you've already won. Let's get more people on our team. Amen.
I ask you to please join me making a public confession of our faith using 